Welcome back to functional MRI test-based analysis of the individual time series. My name is Bob Cox, and now I'm going to talk about various modeling issues that arise in the context of time series regression. So we have a voxel-wise regression model, and an issue that can arise is what's called multicollinearity, where we have two or more regressors highly correlated. And if this happens, it's very difficult to distinguish effects among these regressors, they, that is, get reliable beta estimates for two regressors that are close to being the same. A sample error message, which we've seen before, indicates that the re regressors of in interest signal are in trouble. The program will print out regressor messages like this in the signal submatrix, in the noise only submatrix, and in the entire matrix. The purpose of this these this checks is to warn you about multicollinearity. Multicollinearity usually arises from errors in modeling. That is, uh, if you have two identical regressors, for example, this that's the absolute perfect collinearity, and this is just usually a mistake in stimulus timing. Our programs actually check for that, but nevertheless, if you have put in things that are very close to the same, it doesn't check for that and that can reduce regressors that are very close to the same, and it will check for that result. Exact multicollinearity is rare because it usually is a mistake, but you can have a high degree of correlations from a mistake that isn't so obvious, and the usual cause of that is too many basis functions in the response model, but it can also be due to a poor experiment design. For example, if you have a, a Q, for example, pay attention to the emotion on this person's face, and then there's a very short, like, two-second video. The cue, and then there's another type of experiment, another type of stimulus where you have the cue is just tell me if this person has long hair or short hair, and then the two-second video. And then the problem is the short video and the cue response are probably essentially identical in timing, and so you'd be unable to distinguish between those two. So in AFNI, there are several tools for examining matrix and getting diagnostics from it. Uh, there's one in R, examine XMAT. There's something called timing tool in Python, and another one called XMAT tool in Python. It's better to set up a prototype analysis and then run, run, run that through one of these tools in order to find problems before acquiring data sets that may turn out to be very difficult to analyze. Another problem is with noise, and we will further talk about this later, but if when you have temporal correlations in noise, that is, in the noise is not called, is, the jargon is it's not white anymore, then this can be caused by physiological effects such as breathing, heartbeat, and motion. Then the betas that are calculated from our normal ordinary least squares regression are unbiased, that is, they don't contain any systematic the error up or down from this uh, correlated no noise in time, but the statistics computed for them, the voxel-wise uh, T or F for the betas, uh, as what, uh, from ordinary least squares are done assuming no correlations in time, and this is a modeling error, but a modeling error about the noise, not about the signal, unlike the multi-correlation, multi-collinearity stuff. This has relatively little impact on group analysis if only if you're only using the betas for, from each subject at the group level. If you use the betas, the estimate of the betas reliability, which is which is basically the T statistic, from uh, in AFNI's 3D MEMA program in what's called meta-analysis, that where you're analyzing statistics of statistics, then that's a problem because your your T statistics that are input to 3D MEMA will be biased in the wrong direction. So there's an AFNI approach to deal with this, which will be discussed in a later talk, and this is uh, called 3D Remofit, which allows for voxel-wise correction for this time series correlation in the noise. Now, there's a bunch of practical issues with fMRIs, that have one, one of which is you usually have multiple imaging runs per subject, perhaps as many as 10. So well, there are three different 
basic approaches to this. One is to analyze each run separately. This this is this, is a, this can be done in AFNI and FSL, for example. Generally, then you have to have enough task repetitions in each run to do this. If you only have one of each type of task in a run, the betas from it will be very unreliable. In in this way, though, then you get betas from multiple runs in each subject, and you can test cross-run difference with enough if you have enough uh, data. And you could do this at a at the group level or possibly even in the individual subject level. Depending on what you want, you usually need to summarize the multiple betas before the group analysis. There is a program in AFNI called 3D MVM, multivariate modeling, which allows multiple values per subject per task. That will be discussed in one of the group analysis talks later. A second way to deal with multiple runs per subject is to concatenate the runs in time. So it will take 10 runs, put them all together, and then we'll end up with one big data set with maybe a thousand points in time, perhaps. But analyze each run with a separate regressor for each condition type. You can do this in AFNI and SPM, for example. So then the, it's very similar to the previous method, but it does, uh, it basically does the analysis instead of say 10 runs with 10 analyses, 10 runs with one big analysis, but still getting individual betas for e each task in each run. And so, it, this, it's the same kind of analysis situation. You either need to summarize multiple betas before the group analysis, average them, for example, or you need to uh, have some way of carrying them forward in, in a group, to the, in a collection to the group analysis. The third way is to concatenate the runs and analyze with a single regressor across runs. That is a single regressor for each condition type. Visual gets one, auditory gets one. This is the default in AFNI. And this implicitly assumes there's no response attenuation across runs because we're calculating the same beta, one beta for the for the for the visual task, for example. So a task in event in run number one is treated identically to a task event in run number seven. If you wish then to allow for cross-block or cross-event attenuation, there are a couple of methods in AFNI. One is called the IM, or individual modulation method, and the other one is called the AM, or amplitude modulation regression. That's described in a later talk. Another practical issue is bringing the different subjects' data into sort of the same magnitude range in order to compare them and contrast them across subjects. And in AFNI, we generally do this with percent signal conver change conversion. Why do we make the beta become the percent signal change instead of just fitting the data as it is? Well, it's to do what I said. We have to compare across subjects, which need, we means we need to uniformize the, the scale under which different subjects come. The data from MRI and in the bowl don't really have any useful physical or physiological meanings. The baseline will be different across subjects, uh, possibly simply from the scanner hardware and software automatically cho choosing scaling values to produce reasonable range of numbers in, in, that, in, the, in the image file. And it's relative changes that can be compared across subjects, not that fMRI doesn't measure an absolute level of neural activity in any way at all. And the other reason we recommend the percent signal change, and that's the default in AFNI, again, is that the bold effect is really a multiplicative effect on the overall voxel signals. Too much more deoxyhemoglobin means that the, the voxel signal is multiplied by a smaller number. More oxyhemoglobin means the voxel signal from is multiplied by a larger signal, because the blood is actually a relatively small component of any of most voxels, but it, the magnetic field from the blood affects the entire voxel signal, all the tissues. So uh, the way we implement this in AFNI is pretty simple. We pre in the pre-processing step, just before regression, the data is scaled so the voxel-wise mean is 100. Every voxel is just multiplied or divided by a number so that its mean becomes 100. Then the, then the beta it becomes a percent signal change relative to the mean, not to the baseline, the, the small the small value. This is tiny because a, a tiny effect because the 
bold effect is small, so this will, the type we're not comparing to a baseline or, or to the mean is really negligible error, considering all the other things that can go wrong. There are alternative approaches. One is to do global mean scaling to allow for a whole brain drift in signal. This, this certainly happens. Uh, and there you scale so the mean of each EPA volume is the same or in, inside a brain mask. So you calculate the mean and multiply or divide so that it all comes out to be the same number, say a thousand or a billion or whoever. Another way is called grand mean scaling where you don't, where you simply scale each subject by a single number rather than each volume like the previous one so that the mean over of the subject over all the volumes being analyzed is a constant. If you really want to do this in AFNI, you can do this, but we don't recommend it because then peculiar things happen. You have image, you have with high field imaging, so 3T and even more at 7T, the images are not uniform as they come from the scanner across the brain. The deeper parts of the brain tend, tend to be darker than the uh, outer parts of the brain. And so then they'll look like they have smaller betas if you don't scale them at a voxel-wise level. Well, the famous statistician, George Fox, said that all models are wrong. Some are useful. So getting your model to be useful is, is the craft of any kind of data analysis, and, and including fMRI. Uh, we use an idealized response model. We, so we find what we're looking for. The beta says this shape, we needed two of this shape to fit the data. So the beta is two. So if we were looking for a different shape, my beta might be 1.9. And if we were looking, for, and if our, the shape we're looking for in our regressor is not much like the data, we're going to get, get a small beta. And there might be stuff in there that we don't even find. Um, if there's a lot of variability across trials, that is, the responses uh, vary in magnitude a lot, or there's and or there's a lot of noise that changes from time to time in this, which is in the in the data, which is an unfortunate and fortunately uncommon fact, then you can model each trial separately. That's what we call individual modulation. And then there's this, there's a lot of linearity assumptions, and what, if, that we assume the data is a sum of different pieces, and then we just calculate how much of each piece is needed to fit the data in each voxel. And there's an implicit assumption here, and in most most other neural uh, measurement schemes, is that when a trial is repeated, the response is assumed to be the same, the same in magnitude, uh, so we, or possibly just the same in shape with different magnitudes. And this is very common in neuroimaging because of any kind is simply or MEG, EEG, uh, fMRI, even single unit recording because the no data is so noisy that we have to get a lot of copies of it and average things together in some complicated way. So that's an assumption. The assumption is probably not completely right, uh, but we do what we have to. There's an assumption that the remember that there's a response for a block is is additive, so that if you if the block is longer, the block builds up a bigger intensity. There's certainly this is true in experiment, experiments, but it's not really highly accurate. So if you're looking, if all your blocks have the same duration, then that doesn't really matter. But if you have blocks with different durations, then their magnitudes may vary simply from the fact they have different durations. But modeling that is tricky, and uh, we have a we have approaches to do that in AFNI. But there's an, if you have an experiment where the blocks have significantly different durations in time, you need to be careful in order to figure out what the what the effects are. So that's it for now.